Okay, getting started. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We'll get started in just a minute. Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Understanding Irish Land Divisions. My name is Trisha Labby, Events Manager here at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. I'll be your moderator for today's program. This webinar is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. American Ancestors and NEHGS is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history, and we're pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Our presenter today is senior genealogist Rhonda R. McClure. Rhonda is a nationally recognized professional genealogist and lecturer. Before joining American Ancestors NEHGS in 2006, she ran her own genealogical business for 18 years. She was a contributing editor for Heritage Quest Magazine, Biography Magazine, and was a contributor to the Family History Channel Magazine and American History Magazine. In addition to numerous articles, she's also the author of 12 books, including the award-winning The Complete Idiot's Guide to Online Genealogy, Finding Your Famous and Infamous Ancestors, and Digitizing Your Family History. She's the editor of the sixth edition of the Genealogist Handbook for New England Research. Some of Rhonda's areas of expertise include, of course, Irish research, immigration and naturalization, late 19th and early 20th century urban research, State Department federal records, New England, Midwest, Southern, German, Italian, Scottish, French Canadian, and New Brunswick research, as well as internet research, genealogical software, and online trees. The presentation today will focus on Irish land records and how to access these important records for your own research. After Rhonda's, Rhonda's presentation, we will have time for questions from you. So at any point during the presentation, feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A panel. To access that panel, you can click on the Q&A button found with your Zoom controls, type and submit. We'll address as many of those questions as possible at the end of the presentation. In this Zoom webinar, you have the ability to turn on live closed captioning. Located near your other Zoom controls, you'll either see a closed captioning live transcript button or a three dot ellipses button. If you click on one of those, you'll have the option to choose live transcription, and this will enable live transcriptions to show on your screen as we speak. We invite you to turn on that feature if you wish. There is a handout for this lecture, which is available for purchase at the American Ancestors online bookstore. The link to, the per uh, to purchase the handout was provided in the reminder email for the program and will be included in the follow-up email after today's live broadcast. This session is also being recorded and you'll have access to that recording on our website or YouTube channel. So if you miss anything during our live broadcast today or can't stay for the whole program, not to worry, you can always review the presentation later. So without further ado, I will pass things over to Rhonda to get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, webinar all about Irish land divisions. Uh, I am sure that many of you who have researched in Ireland have wondered why do some of their land divisions kind of share the same name, etc. cetera. Uh, so we are going to take a closer look at these various land divisions, and hopefully by the end, you'll understand the difference between them. Basically, uh, while we call them land divisions, I would say that the more appropriate term is administrative divisions, because really every one of them has a purpose for its existence. And so you can see on this slide that on the left hand side, I have broken up the civil divisions and on the right hand side, the ecclesiastical divisions and many of the civil divisions are the most important for what we are researching with our family history. Uh, so we're gonna go into all of these divisions uh, separately to explain what each one of them means. 
So why are why is it important to learn these about these divisions? What is it that makes them so important and causes us so much grief when we're researching our Irish ancestry? Well, in Ireland, there are many townlands and parishes that share the same name, making research difficult. We're going to touch on that in a moment. If you understand where a townland is located and under which other administrative districts that townland is attached, it makes for more efficient research. It also makes your research more accurate. Of course, understanding these divisions uh, can be a nightmare in and of itself. And many times we tend to give up. Uh, but hopefully by the end of this, you will understand each and every one of them. So we're going to talk about the various land divisions of Ireland. We're going to start with townlands. This is the smallest geographical division of land in Ireland. It is also the most important of the I divisions for you. Because without a townland, it's very hard to understand the other divisions. Uh, townlands vary in size. And as I mentioned in the handout, the size is based on the acreage and or the quality of the acreage. So if it is high quality land, it's going to be a smaller townland. If it is a lot of bogs, etc., it might be a larger townland. They are Gaelic in origin, and there are more than 60,000 townlands in Ireland. Why is it important to identify them? Well, as I mentioned, it is the most important item of where your ancestors came from. It often uh, it can be found in parish records, estate records, court records, newspapers, and naturalization records over here in America. And that is really, you've got to exhaust all of the US research options before going across. Knowing Ireland is not enough. Uh, the townlands, though, can distinguish individuals with the same name. We have lots of, of surnames that are very, very common. And in many instances, they all share the same given names. So knowing exactly which townland in a particular area your ancestor came from can help you differentiate from one of the other individuals. One of my go-to websites for seeking townlands is townlands.ie. When you get to the website, which is uh, shown at the bottom of this slide, you get an overview of the current count in Ireland of a lot of the different land divisions. And this is an ongoing project, another reason that I like it. So you can search for your townland. Uh, in this case, I typed in Lightry, and it shows me that there are two, Light Tree Lower and Light Tree Upper. And in a weird kind of twist, usually the upper is below the lower. I haven't figured that one out yet. But what it gives me is the civil parish, the barony, and the county. Uh, it doesn't give me all the land divisions, but it gives me enough that I can do a lot more when it comes to my research and record availability. So we are going to look at Light Tree Lower. And when you click on that, it gives you even more information. Uh, I have underlined some of the more important pieces. Light Tree Lower is in the Electoral Division of Drom de League North, in the Civil Parish of Drom de League, in the Barony of West Carberry East Division, in the County of Cork. So after you click on the parish in question, or the townland in question, you get more of those divisional uh, names. And there's always a map attached to the townland, allowing you to kind of get a sense of where it is in respect to other areas of a particular county. From the townland, our next largest item is the 
civil parish. The civil parish is a collection usually of somewhere between 25 and 30 townlands. Uh, they actually grew out of the Church of Ireland parishes. And because of that, they share the name usually of the Church of Ireland parish. Of course, like many of the land divisions in Ireland, they can cross county borders. Uh, so it's not unusual to find a civil parish that is in both, uh, say, County Cork and County Kerry. So just keep that in mind. Uh, they are referred to, though, in your census, your taxes, and your land surveys. Why are, once again, why are they important? Well, they are especially important when you are looking for early entries of a family. As we know, censuses for Ireland don't exist until 1901. Uh, our closest kin to that are what we call the tithe plotment books between 1823 and 1838, and then Griffith's valuation that was begun in 1847 and published in 1864. Four. These are all arranged uh, by the civil parish, and then there under you will find the townland names. So again, knowing this slightly larger land division is critical to finding the townland that you are most interested in. In addition to uh, townlands.ie, which I just showed you. Another great resource is uh, johngrenham.com and his place names, you can actually type in your townland or part of the townland. And then you can just submit that or you can also submit the county. You can see that just below where we put uh, Liz Denvama, uh, Varna, and then you can do a search. What you will get is, again, highlights. And in this case, we have Lisden Varna uh, Clare, in County Clare in the civil parish of Kilmoon, and then the Poor Law Union and the Registrar's District, which we will talk about later. So again, now we know the civil parish is Kilmoon, allowing us then to uh, work with that townland. For those of you who live in and around the Boston area and or are planning a trip to Boston and wish to come to our uh, research center, we have access to John Grenham at NEHGS. Another place that you can go for your uh, to identify civil parishes is Shane Wilson's uh, website, swilson.info. Please note all of these URLs are included in the handout. Uh, this one is a great free site that allows you again to type in the place name and to get your information. So let's move on to the barony. A barony is a collection of civil parishes. So we're going from smallest to largest here in regards to uh, our land divisions. The, the barony is actually a historical subdivision. They were based on the Tuas, uh, which were boundaries of the Celtic tribes uh, that took their names from the either the tribe or the families that were in charge. Uh, when they passed an act in 1898, redefining local government that uh, eliminated the baronies. However, baronies are important for the time period that we are usually researching in, which is well before 1898. Like some of our other land divisions, these also can cross county borders. The baronies are important for the early, what we call censuses, uh, but more importantly, the property valuations, as well as your registry of deeds and the early, early civil survey that was taken in 1654 to 1656. Uh, specifically, Griffiths was recorded by barony. So in other words, in order to effectively use Griffiths um, in the past, it was necessary to know the uh, boundary or the barony. 
1852. Then they started to use the poor law union, which we will talk about in a little bit. Of course, most of us go on to ancestry and we type in our, our name of our person. However, to effectively know if you've got the right person of the name, because some names are super common, it's better if you can know more about where your individual was residing. Uh, digitized versions are, you know, organized in the simplest terms. So on ancestry, ask about Ireland. So again, knowing the name of your person is only half the battle. Knowing that they're in a particular county is good. Knowing further to the smaller divisions is the best way to identify. And if you are planning a trip to the Registry of Deeds in Dublin to search the land transactions or the wills, uh, you're gonna have to know uh, your ancestor's barony to be able to access these records. Returning to uh, our Lightry search, uh, this time on johngrenham.com, you can again see Lightry Lower and Lightry Upper. I do want to call your attention, though, uh, into the big green box that says Place Names Search for Lightry, and you'll see the little asterisk after it. John Grenham's uh, site is very, very sp specific when it comes to how things are spelled. So wild cards are encouraged. And because Lightry has a comma after it to separate Lightry Lower, Lightry Upper, the only way to find Lightry is to put in that little asterisk. If I just type in Lightry, I don't find it. Uh, again, you can see though that I have the, you know, the county, the civil parish, the poor law union, the registrar's district. Uh, the poor law unions are often uh, equivalent to uh, some of the uh, baronies, etc. cetera. So, uh, but when you click on the civil parish, what I get is, the civil parish of Drumda League, and to find the quote census type records, this would be like Griffiths, Ty, the Plotmans, etc. You will want to go over to the far right list of research sources, and you can see the red arrow is highlighting the thirteen census type records. Clicking on that will give you a long list of a variety, including the early book of survey and. Uh, you know, proprietors in 1641 that was dated very, very early, all the way down to, it's just at the very, very bottom there, you'll see Griffith's valuation with an online hot link and more information. So clicking on that is actually going to take me to a whole other site. It will take us to, this is uh, Griffith's valuation on askaboutireland.ie. And this is where you can do some searching. And so I set this up so that we could limit uh, because I'm not sure of the father's name of my Burke ancestor. So all I've got is Burke in the step one mandatory. You'll see the surname is Burke. I have skipped the first name in step two, but I have selected the county of Cork and I have selected the civil parish of Drum de League. This then takes me to a list that was not gigantic. There were six of them. And I had to look at each one of them, but I did manage to find that there was a Daniel Burke who was registered in. Uh, light tree lower. And so clicking on the little page that like that looks like a little book page, uh, that will reveal the original Griffiths valuation page itself. And Daniel is kind of down towards the bottom, and he's actually uh, being uh, valuated on two pieces of property. So 7A and 7B have to do with his little piece of property specifically, whereas uh, all the other information, so he is the uh, occupier of the land. The immediate lesser, that's the person who owns the property outright, is William Clark. And then we get a description of the land. This is actually a decent piece of land because it's got a home, an office, and land. And then we get the acreage and then what they call the rateable valuation. That's 
what's going to get taxed, et cetera. So the two important things to take from Griffith's valuation, aside from the fact that our, our ancestor is there, is uh, below the light tree lower townland name is the ordnance survey information. So you'll see that in the red uh, rectangle. And then the 7A and B are important. If we return to the results page, there are two little magnifying glasses. I go to the big one because that's going to open up a whole new window for me. The little one just opens up a pop-up. Uh, so you can see that I have the arrow under the bigger of the two magnifying glasses. This is actually going to take me to a map of the Ordnance Survey map. And I will tell you, this takes a great deal of patience in working with these maps. The maps tend to have a, <clears throat> uh, when you first view it, there's a little rectangle and there's a circle. Somewhere in that area where the two overlap is supposed to be where your town land is. So it can take some creativity because as you zoom in, you lose that rectangle and circle. I did find Light Tree Lower, and then once within Light Tree Lower, I was able to identify his 7A and 7B areas. 7A is the kind of oblong circle, and 7B is a smaller section of land, and that's in the regular circle. Of course, Ancestry has Griffith's valuation. You can do a search, but you can also browse. Many people, when they use Ancestry, they just type in a name. If they don't find what they're looking for, they move on. I encourage you to browse your barony, your parish, really get into it and look around to see what's there, what you can further uh, examine. And so by doing that, you get the barony of Burishul, the union of Newport, and again, you get Griffith's valuation, the printed uh, version that came out in 1864. So we're going to move on to our poor law unions. And this is a, this is a concept that, that we as Americans ha struggle with. Uh, it is actually based on the 1838 Poor Law Act, which established relief systems of workhouses for the poor. In other words, they were very aware of poverty in Ireland. In fact, this is actually a carryover from how England was handling their poverty issue, uh, which they had passed a poor law act earlier. The workhouse is situated in a market town. And then usually, not always, the poor law union takes its name from that market town. There are 163 poor law unions. In 1851, those poor law unions were further uh, dissected, for lack of a better term, into dispensary districts. And within each of these dispensary districts, you had a doctor who was assigned to that district to take care of the poor. One of the important things about poor law uh, relief itself is that in order to receive relief, you did not necessarily have to be, uh, and you did not have to enter the workhouse. Uh, there was the ability to receive food and money for those who didn't actually go into the workhouse. And this is referred to as outdoor relief. To give you an idea of what a poor law uh, union looks like, you'll see this little map here for uh, Dunshlalan in County Meath. And the, so the boundaries are this poor law union. And then there are letters that identify, letters and numbers that identify the uh, areas that pertain to the different items. The workhouse was the main item of a poor law union. And the reason that they were put into those market towns is so that the local tradesmen of the market town could bid on contracts to supply goods to the workhouse. So it was kind of a twofold thing. It was helping the, the, the poor of the area, but it was also helping the tradesmen to continue to earn 
by supplying the goods. In other words, they were paid for their goods and, and labor. Each poor law union is overseen by a board of guardians. <clears throat> Why are the poor law unions important? Well, obviously workhouse records, those are essential. The poverty relief loans also uh, are kind of like micro credit loans that were given to individuals in the 19th century, including during the famine years. And they can give you a lot of important information about your ancestor and their families. Also, keep in mind that your Griffiths valuation were recorded by Poor Law Union. Here we have an example in the 1901 census, the earliest of the censuses that survive for a workhouse in uh, the trim rural in, in Me County Meath. Now, unfortunately, in this, in, in this example, uh, the, they were only recorded with their initials, but this also shows why sometimes if you type in a person's name in the search on the National Archives of Ireland for somebody in the census, and you don't find the person you're looking for, it's possible they're hiding under their, their initials. Uh, so you may need to then go and find the census pages of the workhouse in the area so that you can truly examine the, uh, that census enumeration. A similar example of, the, of identifying the local land divisions can be seen on swilson.info, and he will give you uh, the screenshot, uh, uh, we've got a screenshot of swilson.info in which it identifies the PLU, the Poor Law Union. You will often find in certain areas the, that acronym, the abbreviation Poor Law Union. Uh, so once you've identified that, uh, you can then further find where the workhouse was and then be able to investigate further. Family Search, fortunately, has digitized a number of workhouse records. Uh, I can, when you search for, if we continue with the Trim Poor Law Union, you will come up with a list of the, the minute books that were handled by the Board of Guardians. This was the individuals who were in charge of managing that workhouse in Trim. And they tend to be arranged by date. Um, I will be honest, this screenshot was taken within our building, where, and we are considered an affiliate library, so I cannot tell you if you can access this from home. Uh, it may be that you would have to go to either a family history center or to an affiliate library. Eventually, with the advent of civil registration, the poor law unions from from them morphed into the superintendent registrar's districts. And that, so basically the boundaries are the same between the poor law union and the superintendent registrar's district. Civil registration for non-Catholic marriages began in 1845. That could be Jewish, that could be anything. Begin in 1845. Full civil registration, including Catholic marriages, starts in 1864. So births, marriages, and deaths begin in 1864 for everyone. To give you an example of a, super, or a superintendent registrar's district, you will see that on the left-hand side is the district map in its entirety for all of Ireland. And then you can see Longford is here and it includes three different little uh, uh, civil parishes. So understanding the uh, districts can help you to find civil records as well. Once again, as with everything, some of these tend to cross our county borders. Within the uh, superintendent registers district, which again, was the poor law union, 
you now find general registrar districts. And these mirror those dispensary districts that each got assigned a doctor. At the start of civil registration, the doctor served as the registrar for signing off and maintaining information on the births, marriages, and deaths. Uh, but again, he was you were overseen by the superintendent. These records are available at uh, irishgenealogy.ie. And you can see that you can type in a name, you can put in a last name, so you can narrow it down to the civil registration district, which is the superintendent registration district. And then you can narrow down by a year range and birth, marriage, or death. You can also browse the database by district office. When you start to type in your name for the civil registration, it will pop up and populate with like, so in other words, when I start to type in BA, anything that has BA to start with will populate. But here we're going to look for a Patrick Sullivan in Bandon, 1870 to 1880. And you can have a, you know, a limited search to just that area. But one of the ways that I really love to work with irishgenealogy.ie, especially if all I know is that they came from a specific county, is I kind of flip that. So instead of just typing in a single uh, superintendent registers district, what I do is I will leave that open and then I will get a bunch of hits. So here we have births for Thomas Burke, who is the ancestor that I was looking for in Lightree Lower before or suspected was in Lightree Lower. And you'll see that above the red uh, rectangle, it says that there are 255 births. I don't need to look at all of those, okay? What I can do is you can see that the, uh, the SR districts are alphabetically arranged. I go to another website, irishgenealogytoolkit.com, uh, where they have identified those uh, PLUs, the, the poor law unions, the SRDs, within each county. And so what I'll do is I'll have that up for whatever county I'm interested in. And then I will just look at the specific uh, SRDs for the county I'm interested in. This allows me a broad approach when I don't have the tiniest of details. Usually this is most effective if I know the parents' names or I know some other identifying item about the person I am seeking. I just don't know where within the county he's coming from. Within your poor law unions were found uh, what were called originally poor law electoral divisions. Uh, the, the, these divisions were responsible for the election of the members who serve on the board of guardians in uh, that oversaw the poor law union and the workhouse. Uh, they were intended to be equal in both population and rateable land. In other words, that's the land that qualifies for taxes. Not all of Irish land qualified that way. Uh, during the act of 1898, where they were redefining the local uh, government, the poor law electoral divisions were renamed to district electoral divisions. So the DED uh, consists, not surprisingly, of a group of townlands. They become critically important when using valuation revision books, uh, which we will talk about in a minute, as well as the 1901 and the 1911 censuses. When you search on the National Archives of Ireland website, uh, it gives you the opportunity to specify a DED. So in other words, if you know your townland, then, and you've used townlands.ie to identify the electoral division, you can type that out and you can narrow down your search to just a specific area, a specific group of townlands. And so one of the things that 
uh, a search that was undertaken was for the townland of Park Row in the county of Galway. And you can see the district electoral division, the DED is Clarenbridge, C-L-A-R-I-N, and then the word bridge. So if we return to the, you know, so that would be what we would be looking for, Clarenbridge. However, let me just give you a little tip. When it comes to spelling in Ireland, it is fluid. Many times, especially with your vowels, you're going to find some variation. And in the case of uh, Clarenbridge, that was what happened to us. So as we returned to the National Libraries of Ireland search uh, field and put in Clarenbridge, we actually were told there was nothing, that it didn't exist. Well, we know that it exists because it's the name of the particular area. So instead, uh, we had to give, we had to look a different way to figure out what was going on. And in this instance, if you looked for the townland of Park Row, then you saw that the DED was spelled slightly differently. Clarenbridge, C-L-A-R-E-N. So if you are told that your uh, district you know, your DED does not exist. It has, it's a spelling error. So keep that in mind. Uh, use one of the townlands, even if it's not yours, uh, use a townland that's associated with that DED and see how it is spelled because that's what's going to uh, give you an answer and allow you to then do the broader search on the DED. You can also browse the 1901 and 1911 censuses uh, as another manner of searching. We've become so uh, used to typing in the name of a person, but I encourage you to browse anywhere that you can, like on Ancestry over on the right-hand side, if they give you a browse option. Here on the National Archives of Ireland, there's the browse census. It will give you an understanding of, for instance, in the DED of Clarenbridge, the townlands that are associated. Because it's possible that maybe you're close, but just don't have the right townland. And if you can see all the other townlands in a particular larger division, it will give you a better understanding of the geography where your ancestor is coming from. The valuation revision books trace property history. Uh, these are the books that are created after Griffiths. So Griffiths was the very, very first valuation of all the land and is what we consider to be a census. Again, because we have no censuses till 1901, from 18, you know, the 1850 to 1901, that's a lot of time. What you can use instead are what are known as valuation revision books. They trace your property history. Again, organized by Poor Law Union, that's the larger of the districts, and then they're in under by District Electoral Division. Both of these items are needed. Uh, there's a great book, if you can find it in a library, uh, it is out of print, and I have not been able to find one for sale. If I ever do, I'm snatching it up, just to let you know. Uh, George B. Handron created Townlands in Poor Law Unions. Uh, he took a bunch of pamphlets that were reprints from the General Registrar Office out of Dublin and combined them and, and arranged everything into poor law unions, also identifies your superintendent registrar district and the DED, and there under you had the list of townlands. So it's a valuable resource as well. Again, he published this back before we had lots of what we have now on the internet. But again, I sometimes like to have the page, the pamphlet, you know, giving me the bigger geography of an area. So what's my DED? Well, there's a couple of different places that you can identify this, townlands.ie, as well as the 1901 alphabetical index to townlands and towns of Ireland, and the indices to the parishes, baronies, poor law unions, district electoral divisions, et cetera, that is available on irishancestors.ie. So if we go to Irish ancestors, here we see 
the index of town lands, we have the town of Carn Hill, we have the acreage, and you can see just with these three Carn Hills for starters, there are multiple uh, town lands of the same name, but we also see the how the acreage can vary. So the top Carn Hill has 95 area uh, acres, um, three roots and three perches, whereas the Carn Hill with the red arrow has 590 acres, zero roots and 20 perches. And then the bottom Carn Hill, 85 acres, three roots and 20 perches. Roots and purchases uh, perches are a, a sub uh, measurement. There are four roots to an acre. And then I want to say there are 100 perches to a root, but I could be wrong on that. However, uh, there is a link in the handout uh, if you have, uh, if you get it, that will explain all of that to you. However, as we look at the Carn Hill with the red arrow, it takes us across. It's in County Mayo in the barony of Eris in the parish of Kilcommon in the county district superintendent's registrar district of Belmullet, and then in the district electoral division of Knocknalower. So with that, we can then go in and search. Returning to Lightry, uh, using this exact same index of townlands, and I've given you the full URL here within the lecture so that you can take advantage of this index. Uh, again, I have used uh, Lightry to search. And when I do a search, I get the Lightry lower and I get Lightry upper. So there's multiple different websites where you can use a townland and get the bigger picture. Initially, I am given the, um, the county barony and the county district, but that view gives me the electoral division, which told me that I needed uh, North Dromda League. So I know that it's the Poor Law Union of Skibbereen, and then I needed the electoral division of North Dromda League. And they, uh, the reason that these are not available for viewing on family search is because they are accessible from Dublin and Dublin's land uh, registry, deed registry is still making money off of them. If you are physically going to Salt Lake City to the Family History Library, you can view these books uh, and see them. So to give you an example of what they look like, we are going to look at North Dromda League. And at the very top, you can see we are in the county of Cork, the Union of Skibbereen, that's the Poor Law Union, in the rural district of Skibbereen, in the electoral division of Dromda League North. And then the very first page of the valuation revision list book gives me an index of the townlands and tells me the page where I can find that townlands information. Going further on, the, the benefit or the, the strength to the valuation revision list books is the fact that you will find when someone is leaving an area. So in the second name uh, from the top, we have, there is a <clears throat> individual's name that is crossed out and then there is a new name written above. If we go all the way across to the far right, it usually will tell us why they left and when they left. Could be through death, it could be they moved, whatever. This is as close to a following them through the census as you're going to get when it comes to researching your ancestors in Ireland before the censuses exist. We're going to switch a little bit now. We're going to talk about the uh, ecclesiastical divisions, the church parish, the Church of Ireland and the Roman Catholic Church both use the term parish. This has caused a lot of confusion among Irish researchers. Add in the fact that the Church of Ireland parish name and the civil parish from that same area usually take the same name and we've got quite the mess. So here you can see that the civil parish on the left, a map with civil parishes on the left, 
And then on the right, you can see the Roman parish. So the civil parish and the Church of Ireland are both going to take that same name, whereas the Roman parish has a completely different name to it. One of the best resources for helping you to identify your church parish based on civil parish is Brian Mitchell's Guide to Parish Records. Uh, it is available in book form. It's also available in electronic form. It was published uh, by Genealogical Publishing Company. So here we have in County Eight Antrim, we have some of the civil parishes. They're arranged alphabetically. To the right, or I'm sorry, to the left is a number that is to the uh, to an atlas for that he also published, giving you an idea of where it is. So it'd be like you could can use both books. Uh, to the left is the um, or to the right is an identification of it within the uh, the ordinance surveys. And then we have the main three religions, Church of Ireland, Roman Catholic, and Presbyterian, followed by an others column. So if they had Methodist, if they had Quakers, whatever. The Church of Ireland will only have a name in the column or in the row if it differs from the civil parish name. So if we look at the civil parish of Larn, second from the top, we will see that the Church of Ireland has no name, therefore it is known as the Parish of Larn for Church of Ireland. Surprisingly, the Roman Catholic maintained Larn as well, as did the Presbyterians. And then the year that you see is the earliest that the records exist. If we go down to Laid, the next one down below, you will see that this is not the case. The Roman Catholic parishes have completely different names, and there happen to be two of them, Cushendal and Cushendun, with different uh, years of record availability. So always I go to this guide to parish records to get a sense of what uh, the the parishes, especially if I'm researching Roman Catholic uh, records, because those are the ones that are more easily available online through the uh, National Library of Ireland. They've digitized all of the Republic of Ireland's records that are available. But it helps me in knowing, you know, for Church of Ireland, is it a different name? And what other religions might be associated with a particular area? Just as the Church of Ireland and Roman Catholics used the word parish, they also used the word diocese, which is basically a larger district, which is under the direction of a bishop. And again, you can see that on the right, we have the Church of Ireland diocese. And on the left, we have the, uh, I'm sorry, on the left, we have Church of Ireland. On the right, we have Roman Catholic. And you can see if we just look at uh, Derry and Raffo, Church of Ireland, that diocese is combined into a single uh, division, whereas for the Roman Catholics, each is a separate. Uh, so it's good to be able to find the diocese and see where your records could be as well. Another tip, write down everything you find about your place name, because it's going to be important and you don't wanna have to recreate all these searches to find it again. Uh, some of you may find that creating a spreadsheet is a way to go. And especially if you've got your ancestors in different places. So you can set one up very, very simply. You could also do this just in Word uh, with their table abilities. And that way you can identify, and you'll see here in the example that I'm sharing, that for the townlands, I've identified that with a T in parentheses, and then for the parishes, uh, the Roman Catholic parish, you'll see down at Portuna, uh, Portumna that I've identified that as a Roman Catholic parish. Uh, and then all of these are identified by their civil parish, barony, poor law union, DED, and registrar district. Again, if I've got it all in one place, then I don't have to research for it again. And if you do it in either Word or in Excel, you can uh, alphabetize under any of these uh, columns.
There are many sources, and some of the ones that we've talked about, uh, we'll look at again. But one of the best ones that I like is Samuel Lewis's Topographical Dictionary of Ireland. It was published in 1837. Very often, I find that if I can get something that's published before the changes that were done under the 1851 census, uh, I may see a different uh, aspect of an area. It provides information about the parishes and the baronies. It does not give you the other divisions. Uh, you can download this. It's, it, they are big files, but you can download it at askaboutireland.ie. Another one that I go to, and in fact, not only do I use it frequently within our research center, but I own my own personal paperback copy of this, is the General Alphabetical Index to the Townlands and Towns, Parishes and Baronies of Ireland, based on the Census of Ireland for the year 1851. This is pretty much where everybody gets their names and our arrangement of things. Uh, what you can see here, though, is that for uh, the townland of Bay, there are many of them. And sometimes having them all grouped together and being able to, uh, again, compare them and compare where they are located. Some of them, for instance, there's three just in County Galway alone, allows me to kind of better understand what I'm up against and also what parishes and poor law unions I'm going to have to focus on. This uh, example, this resource is also available to you on archive.org, swilson.info, and irishancestors.ie. And here is a screenshot from swilson.info. And again, it's a free site showing you uh, the Townland Index and database for 1851, allowing you to search. We talked about the 1901 Alphabetical Index. It included the updated district electoral divisions, which are so important that come into play after 1898. And I showed you where that was on uh, Irish ancestors. Again, we have uh, John Grenham. I go here frequently. I will tell you that you can do some simple searching on johngrenham.com for free, but there is a subscription. Uh, it is a subscription site. I consider it well worth it as far as I am concerned because he gives me civil parish maps, poor law union maps, Catholic parish maps, all sorts of items that uh, can help me in further narrowing things down. Again, if we go into him and look for a specific place, again, if I look for Light Tree Cork, again, remember, you've got to use the asterisk. Uh, you can use multiple asterisks in his site, so play around with that. Uh, and then that would allow me access to all sorts of things. Another good resource, though, is Brian Mitchell's New Genealogical Atlas of Ireland. He provides the maps for the civil and religious parishes, barony, and poor law union. This also is available both as a book and as an electronic book that you can download from a genealogical publishing company. And just to let you know that I am not above having as many sources as possible, this is an actual screenshot of my iPad in my books uh, app that shows currently just some of the sources that I have. I am not a surface person. I want to understand everything. And the further back we go, the more we're likely to need additional resources. So while I definitely encourage you to get Irish uh, parish registers and a new genealogical atlas of Ireland, eventually you may have to understand things like the researching, uh, you know, researching your farming ancestors and or going in deeper, especially if you're in the Ulster area, understanding some of the plantations or researching your Scots-Irish if you are that far back in your research. So in summary, use your guides to determine land divisions. You have to be mindful of those land divisions when researching. They are important. And write it down so you don't have to recreate that again. Uh, stay organized because the more ancestors you're researching over in Ireland, if they're not all from the same area, you're going to have multiple places with multiple land divisions.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rhonda. Um, jumping in here. Um, thank you for that wonderful presentation and going over so many resources and record groups um, that folks can use out there for their own Irish research. Um, before we jump into the q and A, I I did want to mention a couple upcoming virtual programs that I think will be especially interesting for this audience. Um, first, on Thursday, March 17th, the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center welcomes historian and NYU professor Dr. Hazia Diner for a free webinar on the Irish and Jews in the nation's urban cauldron. As the title suggests, the webinar will focus on the entwined history of uh, two of America's most influential immigrant groups groups in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So don't miss that fascinating topic and guest speaker. Um, also this month, we have another virtual Irish genealogy program, Finding Irish Origins. A county is not enough. Uh, this online conference includes exclusive access to five pre-recorded lectures, handouts, and other materials. And it all culminates with one in-depth live Q&A session with our expert instructors on Saturday, March 19th. So this is really a, a great next step for your Irish research, a must for everyone working on that out there. Um, a reminder that all paid American Ancestors NEHGS members now receive a 10% discount on our paid virtual programming. So keep that in mind um, to learn more about these events and many others. Uh, we invite you to visit our event calendar at AmericanAncestors.org slash events. Um, we hope to see you again online soon. Um, and uh, now let's answer your questions. So go ahead and type in um, any questions into that Q&A panel. We'll, we'll answer a few here before our time ends. Um, so I had a few to start out with Rhonda. Um, one question we got ahead of time um, was asking about glebes. So I was hoping you could maybe explain what glebes are, how they worked, and maybe a little bit about how to find those. So if your townland has the word glebe included in it, uh, in essence, it is a townland like any other townland as far as people working the land, etc. The glebe word clues you into the fact that the individual who is uh, profiting from the work of those who are on the land is, a, uh, is related to a church, probably Church of Ireland, um, since they were the state church. So anytime you see the word glebe, then it is associated with a minister of sorts. But the work that goes on there is going to be the same. And searching for the townland is the same as everything else that we have done here. Uh, you know, looking up the townland to get your other identifying information, going into those ordnance survey maps to see exactly where it is in respect to other areas in the poor law union, the county, et cetera. Thank you for explaining that, Rhonda. Um, so we did have a couple folks in the Q&A panel who asked um, if townlands are sometimes um, associated with or based on certain family surnames that lived in the area. Have you found any connections to suggest that? More often than not, your surname is, is was derived from the townland. Uh, but uh, in, in other words, if the townland shares the same name as your surname, probably the townland came first, your surname came second. Uh, however, with that said, um, if you are talking about the fact that certain townlands just seem to be ground zero for certain surnames, absolutely. There are pockets throughout Ireland uh, and johngrenham.com will show you where those pockets are for each surname. Great, perfect, thank you. Um, and then um, we had a bunch of questions um, talking about Ulster that like you mentioned and um, also Northern Ireland. Um, the uh, organization of, you know, townlands and, and districts, does that apply to, um, say, Ulster or Northern Ireland as well? Is that really a totally different uh, research topic for folks out there? Uh, actually, it is not. So Ulster is not synonymous with Northern Ireland. Ulster was one of the provinces, the four provinces, and um, there's great detail in the handout about the inception of provinces, etc. But the Ulster province originally had nine counties in it. Northern Ireland is just six of those nine. 
This was done to ensure that the uh, Protestants outnumbered the Catholics. So it was done by design. However, keep in mind that Northern Ireland as an entity did not exist until 1922. So what you all that we talked about still applies as far as that goes. It's only afterwards where things can differentiate. Okay, great. That was a, a common question out there. Um, and then um, I did want to mention, we had a bunch of questions coming in. Um, we've referenced the handout quite a few times. Um, and just to repeat what I said at the top, um, that a link to purchase the syllabus handout um, that Rhonda created to correspond with this webinar will be included in my follow-up email this afternoon. So you'll have a direct link to um, that and it's a, an easy purchase and download. Um, just to, to answer for folks out there. Um, uh, so I think that uh, wraps up the time that we have right now. We have uh, just four o'clock. So I want to thank Rhonda again and um, thank you all for tuning in. Um, if you do have more specific questions about your family history research, you might consider working with our research services team who conducts research for hire. Uh, you can learn more by contacting research at nehgs.org. Additionally, you can go to americanancestors.org slash chat to take advantage of our free chat with a genealogist service. This is great if you have a quick reference question um, as you're doing your research and it's free and available to all Tuesday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time with extended hours, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time on Wednesdays. Thank you again for joining us. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a brief survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American Ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more free programs for you. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.